Good morning on this Lord's Day, the sermon 52 of the book of Revelation. And today's text is Revelation 20, the very last portion from verses 11 to 15. We will read from the English Standard Version, ESV, and Tatum will read that for us. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. From his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Let's pray for the reading of the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word that was read to us this morning. We thank you for your power that's in the word. We ask you, Lord, to help us open wide the scriptures, give us meaning and especially understanding so we don't miss your flow. In Jesus' name, Amen. The title of the sermon today is The Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord. When we talk of the day of the Lord, it is the last day on earth, the day of judgment. Having established that, we must consider another day over 2,000 years ago. It is the day of Calvary or the day of Golgotha. Therefore, both days inform each other in such a way that we must see the connection. It is a matter of life and death. When you have been changed by the day of Calvary, you would have no worries about the day of judgment. If Calvary means nothing to you, then tremble for the terrible day of the Lord. I am moved by a story that Richard Phillips related in his commentary on Revelation. Adoniram Judson was an aspiring young man on the straight and narrow. But he got impressed by someone outstandingly influential. The brilliant upperclassman Jacob Ames concerning enlightenment ideas, Judson resorted to deism as his newfound way of life. This kind of thinking of an absentee god was just getting developed in the West. His 20th birthday marked his decision to live a life of pleasure by going to New York, where Jacob Ames was located. One night, in a pleasure house in New York, he heard moans and groans of a man from the next room. These noises clearly indicated a dying man's cries coming through the walls. He didn't care because being so influenced by the free-thinking style of Jacob Ames, 
He didn't want anything to come in the way of his eagerness to meet him. In any case, by dawn the next morning, the groans and moans subsided. When he left the inn, in the morning, he inquired about the man in the next room. The hotel attendant said, He's gone, poor fellow. Do you know who he was? asked Judson. Oh, yes. The young man was Ames, Jacob Ames. In the next few hours, Judson could not rub this thought out of his mind. Dead. Lost. Yes, lost. Hell struck a blow in Judson's heart. This conviction led Judson on a path to forgiveness that comes from Calvary. Yes, on the day of Calvary, Jesus went to hell for us. And that hell was upon the cruel cross. We need the sight of hell to give us a knuckle-blow wake-up call to its reality. And in this light of this story, I have my three points for the title of my sermon, The Day of the Lord. These points are the judge, the judgment, and the death of death, the judge, the judgment, and the death of death. Let's begin with point one. The judge. Imagine going before a judge. Even if you know you have a good case to win, you still won't sleep the night before your day in court. You get butterflies in your tummy. And when you see wars and rumors of wars, don't treat these phenomena lightly. The final day of the Lord is drawing near. He is the ultimate judge who will straighten out everything. The description in verse 11 is not for us to know when the earth and sky will disappear. It is describing the unfathomable greatness of God. He is a quad trillion times greater than the earth and sky whose boundaries he himself has set. In other words, when God shows up, there is no need for earth and sky. God is indescribably bigger than them. They took a lot of energy in the world to speak about humanism and the glory of man. Let's look at the skies. They look like they've disappeared when he fills these spaces. That's the best you can get in symbolism, trying to explain the bigness and the majesty of God. And then the color white, it shows us the full justice of God. And verse 11 reads like this. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away 
and no place was found in them. Can you picture that? Anyone who had made God small or, or, or think that God is small will see that he cannot escape the bigness of God on this day. The disappearance of earth and sky are the appearance of God. Well, and the appearance of God shows the biggest picture you can ever imagine. Can you picture that? God's presence is all over the earth. He is filling the earth. It is the picture that the whole universe is on trial. There's a great court case. It is like God is in your face. U.S. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis recently signed a bill that bans teachers from giving instruction on sexual orientation or gender identity in kindergarten through third grade. He came under fire by a majority of opponents. Why is there a minority struggling to hold good values? Jesus said in his day, Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for you. What is worse when being ro railroaded by culture? We ask that question again. What is worse when being railroaded by culture? And that is the prevailing culture. It is not to speak up that is worse. When the Church of Jesus' day was dictated by cultural and political power, what did the believers do who experienced Pentecost? In the majority, they were witnesses. They spoke up. They were voices. Now the question of judge. Who exactly are involved in the position of judge? Well, we see God. We see Jesus. And we feel the Holy Spirit applying this truth to us. And God as judge is righteous. And by virtue of that principle, we must speak up in our generation. Right time for point two, the judgment, verses 12 and 13. And this involves the great white throne judgment, where there is no escape. The trial can never be remanded. It's an appointment where no excuses can be valid. Why is that? Everyone, whether believer or unbeliever, will have a brand new body, and a brand new body is fit for trial. He can't bribe his doctor because the doctor's profession will have come to an end. There is no need for doctors in that world. God gives these souls new bodies so he can balance his books of justice. And I mention again, keep the day of the cross in one hand and keep the last day on earth in the other hand. The last day is the day of judgment. One set of people, and that's good news, will be pardoned. But another set of people will be sentenced. 
and those who have taken refuge at the cross of Christ by believing in him and in his blood shed for them will go free on the day of judgment. Why? Why? Because he was sentenced for them. The sentence that judge pronounced on them has been placed upon him. And these are the believers. Are you a believer this morning? Come to the cross if you're not a believer. But then, what about the other group? The unbelievers. They have been given enough time the world over to come to Jesus Christ for eternal life. Oh, how we need to plead with the unbeliever. They instead scorn him and rejected him, so they are sentenced to hell where the worm died not. Then there is one more action John saw that will happen on that day. Another book was opened. The book of life. The idea included here is the idea of the judgment seat of Christ. Where Paul says that all Christians will appear at that seat. 2 Corinthians 5.10 In Christian circles, this is riddled with controversy. There is a branch of Christianity which states that once believers are justified, they won't go through the judgment seat as implied in the first book that was opened in our verses. This judgment, but I tell you, this judgment is about the rewards Christians have earned or lost while living this life. And Jesus speaks of rewards as understood by his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5.12. The Pharisees won't get any future rewards in the afterlife, but worthy saints will see the rewards of their hands. And this means that God honoring sacrifices made in this life, we will be rewarded for. While our salvation is equal, our reward is according to what we put into the kingdom of God. There are definitely degrees to rewards. And look at the positions the mother of James and John wanted for them as the sons of thunder, Matthew 20, 20 to 23. Paul speaks of teachers whose works will be evaluated by fire, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 to 15. And now I come to my last point, the death of death. Verses 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And this is a second death. And this also reflects the finality of death as the last dispensation of the world ends. Satan was the lord of death. He was just put into the lake of fire that we read about in previous verses. His prison house of death, which he has been deceiving the nations with, God has finally destroyed. The throwing away of death into the lake of fire 
is a personification which means that death is done away with, death is over, it is no longer a halfway house or any such holding house. The doing away of death reveals a separation from God who is life. And this has paved the way for a new day to dawn. A new day has come like that resurrection day. Remember, remember the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a day making Jesus Lord of history. It was a day marking his reign forevermore. Now all his elect who are raised with him, will reign with him forever and forever. Verse 15. Verse 15. Let's look at verse 15. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. I plead with my audience today, you have to ask, is my name written in the book of life? As long as there is still time, the words of Jesus are, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He has not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. John 5, 24. But the Lord Jesus stands before you in light of the judgment and in light of the resurrection. Another two ways of seeing it. One hand, judgment. Another hand, resurrection. And he tenderly says to one group, Arise to life, but to the other group, Arise to death. I ask you today, which side will you be on? Will you arise to live forever, or arise to die? in everlasting torment. Watch how you stand in the matter of life. Watch how you stand in the profession of life. Watch how you stand in the vocation of life. How you stand today will affect how you stand on that day. Where you stand will most especially affect where God will find you on that day. Standing inside Christ is the safest place on earth. When God opens the books, your name would definitely be recorded with Christ's name clothing you like a robe, like a great robe of righteousness that covers you and clothes you. Oh, friends. Alun Ebenezer, a commentator, tells a story as I come to a final close. A story of a small-time crook who was caught red-handed for breaking into a factory and stealing loads of stuff. He had a hot-shot lawyer who was so convincing that the rogue, that the rogue's father said, perhaps we didn't do it. Perhaps we didn't do it. I tell you, people, when Christians stand on Judgment Day, Jesus, their eternal advocate, will show we did it. But prove to the judge that he paid for it. And then the divine judge will give us 
full pardon, leaving us to say, it's as if we didn't do it. Christ's imprisonment for us on the cross made us go free. And that is how stunning Christ our Advocate is. Behold the day of the Lord. And let's receive the benediction to me. Now may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us today and world without end. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon. If you wish to hear more from Trevor Thomas, please like and share this video. Make sure to subscribe to the channel Apostolic Witness and to turn on the notification bell. May the Lord bless and keep you.